Go and sell all you have and give it to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven. Something, 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 say what? If your hand or your foot gets in God's way, chop it off and throw it away. Say what? Woe to you, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs. Say what? And if your eye distracts you from God, pull it out and throw it away. Say what? 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 Hypocrite. Chop it off and throw say it away. What? Something, something, something. Say what? Hypocrites. Say what? Say what? Pull it out and throw it away. Hypocrites. so great to be with you. Uh, like Emily says, we're doing this series, Say What? Because sometimes the best teaching comes from the hardest sayings. And Jesus said things that were sometimes controversial, they were upsetting, they could even be bizarre, surreal, and odd. The, um, the great English writer from the last century, G.K. Chesterton, he said, it's not that the words of Jesus have been tried and found wanting, it's that they've been found difficult and left untried. And sometimes Jesus says things, and they're so shocking, they're so challenging, they're so hard to stomach, that we leave them untried. But actually, we firmly believe that it's worth pressing into some of these things. And so tonight, the topic is sell your possessions. And whenever we talk about money, it's, it's a difficult balance that we have to strike. And let me just first say off, before we say anything about what Jesus said and about how we interpret that as his church. Let me just say that if you are struggling right now, if coronavirus and the lockdown has gone through your life and has caused problems and challenge, if you're struggling right now, this is not a message for you to feel like, oh, I've got to be giving while I'm down on the floor. This is a message where you need to know that you're loved, that you're cared for, and that we want to support you. We want to uh, give everything that we can in order to make sure that you are okay. As a family and as a body, we want to pull together. In fact, we have a, a fund that is just especially for people that are in unusual, challenging circumstances. And so if you are in that situation, don't feel guilty about this message. Let us know. We want to give to you. And yet Jesus did say this incredible thing, and you saw it on the trailer. He says to this man, he says these words, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. This is the kind of word that is so challenging, it's so shocking, that we almost just want to just push it to one side. Imagine that that's not really what Jesus means, and that's not really what Jesus requires of us. But actually, that's what Jesus said. And so what do we do with this? How do we interpret this? Does it literally mean that every single person who is a Christian or wants to become a follower of Jesus should give all of their possessions to the poor? How do we find our way through? Well, listen, the first thing that you need to know about this phrase, this statement, this sentence that Jesus says is that it is in response to a question. Someone comes to him and asks a question, and this is, in this setting, the answer that Jesus gives to him. And if you've been around church for any length of time, you'll know this story, it's a story uh, which is very familiar for kids from Sunday school, and it's kind of well known in our culture. And some of the things that Jesus says in this encounter with this guy, um, we're, we're used to hearing, they're, they're kind of well-known, well-trodden paths. But I love the trailer, I love that Franco Zeffirelli film, Jesus of Nazareth, where it, it just dramatizes that whole thing. And I think that even though the depiction of Jesus is possibly the worst one ever, the depiction of the guy that comes and asks the question is totally on point. Because his kind of bug-eyed look and backing away from Jesus is just priceless. And that, in a sense, is the kind of reaction that we should expect from this passage. But if we want to understand what Jesus is saying and why he answers in this way, we need to know about the question. We need to know who's asking the question, and we need to know what the question actually means. So we're going to look at the biography of Jesus written by Mark. And it says this in chapter 10. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? 
Now, the first question that we ask ourselves is, who is this guy? And actually, the story that's recorded is actually told by not only Mark, but also Matthew and Luke. And because of Matthew, we know that he is young. He's a young man. And because of Luke, we know that he is a ruler. And because they all note this, because it was an incredible thing, we know that he was rich. So this guy is just a triple threat. He has it all. He has wealth, he has youth, and he has power. And that's why the question is so important. It's so powerful. Because here is someone that has it all, and they're still asking questions. You may be watching You may be here uh, on your own, or maybe you're watching it with a flatmate or with a family member, and you wouldn't particularly call yourself a Christian person, but you've got questions, because all of us at some point get to the realization that you can have everything that the world says you should have in order to be happy, and still feel there's something more. This guy, he's rich, he's wealthy, he is well-heeled. He's young, he's got all of his potential, all of his life ahead of him. And he's got political power, he is a player. And yet with everything that he's got, he still finds himself saying, there's got to be more to life than this. Maybe the reason that you've caught on to this broadcast is that you're asking the same questions. Or you're beginning to dip your feet, your toes into the waters of church. Because no matter what you've got, and all those things are good, there's still part of you that says, there's got to be something more. And so this rich young ruler is incredibly instructive for us because he is an example of someone that has everything that you're supposed to have to be happy and still thinks there's got to be more to life than this. There's got to be a spiritual aspect to life, and I want to know about it. So that's the who, but what about the question? What exactly is he saying in the question? This is the way that it's put in the Bible. It says, Jesus started on his way. Man came up to him. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Someone write eternal life in the comments. Everyone else like it and give me that famous carry out that Emily drew attention to. Eternal life. Now listen, you'd be making a mistake if you thought that this guy was asking Jesus the question, what do I need to do in order to go to heaven when I die? Because that's not what the question is all about. The question is about how do I have an inheritance or a share or a portion? How do I get an investment into the life of the ages? That's the literal translation of that phrase, eternal life. Because the Jews, they had this idea that we're living in a present age and it is flawed. We're in a system where there is injustice and heartbreak. There's upset and there's challenge and difficulty. There's tears and there's cancer. But one day in the future, God's going to bring a new age, a brand new age, where humanity is as it should be, where life is as it should be, where all the potential is fulfilled. And so he says, I want to have a part of that. I want to have a share in that. I want to get in on that. It's a little bit like this. Just imagine this scenario. Imagine that you could go back, your present now self. Imagine that you could go back in time and you could speak to yourself back in February of this year. I mean, we've just had this crazy year, right? I mean, none of it was anything that any of us could have anticipated. And imagine that you could go back to yourself in February, before lockdown, before all of this stuff, before Barnard Castle and all this jazz. Imagine you go back to yourself in February of this year. What would you say to yourself? What would you tell yourself to do? We all know what it is, right? We all know exactly what we would do if we could go back, speak to ourselves, and tell us just one thing. You go back, your present Uh, future you, you go back to past you, February you, and you say, hey, past me, you need to understand that 2020 is an incredible year with a massive disaster. And then past you speaks and says, yeah, I know, tell me about it. I mean, those Australian wildfires, crazy, right? I mean, that's what 2020 is going to go down in the history books. And you say, no, 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 Uh, yeah, forgotten about that. That, that's basic, no, no. Listen, do one thing and do one thing only. What would you tell yourself? Obvious. Buy shares in Zoom. Get shares in Zoom. And so past you saying, what, what, Zoom? What's Zoom? Is it like that kind of business conferencing app? Is it, yeah, yeah, buy shares in Zoom. And then past sense uh, says to you, 
What, are they in trouble? Do they need help? Do they need bailing out? You say, no, 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 no. they're doing fine and they're going to be really fine. This is not about them. This is about you. Trust me on this. Buy shares in Zoom. You will thank me. And past you says, well, you know, I'm not sure I've got that much disposable income. You say, doesn't matter. Get rid of it. Liquidize all your assets. Sell your dog. Get rid of your wife. Whatever you need to do, just get all the money. Buy shares in Zoom. And also uh, Andrex. Good one as well there. Because having shares in Zoom is the equivalent of having shares in something which is kind of there but is nothing like what it is about to become. It is going to go crazy. It's going to go absolutely global. And with this ministry that Jesus has, he's like a man from the future, saying God has a kingdom, and this is a kingdom which is going to transform humanity. And you want to get a share in this kingdom, this life of the age to come. Jesus would sometimes refer to it as eternal life, And sometimes he would refer to it as the kingdom of God. Sometimes he would refer to it as the kingdom of heaven. And there was something about Jesus and the way that he brought that kingdom into the now, the the future kingdom, into the present reality. He was healing the sick. He was proclaiming the love and the grace of God. And people saw it. And this rich young ruler sees. And he has faith that God's going to do something brand new in human history at some point. There's going to be a future kingdom, and it's worth investing in. It's worth getting a share in. And so he says to Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So it is, it's a great question. It is a really, really great question. And you have to ask yourself, why on earth does Jesus go so hard line on him? Why does Jesus tell him to give everything that he has, to sell all his possessions, to give everything to the poor, and then to follow him? Because actually, as far as we know, Jesus didn't say that to everybody. He doesn't say that to anybody else that the Gospels record. He sees Zacchaeus, and Zacchaeus is this kind of corrupt businessman. When Zacchaeus says, I'm going to sell half of my possessions, Jesus says, salvation's come to this house today. And when he meets with Nicodemus, we talked about Nicodemus just a few weeks ago. Nicodemus was kind of like a, 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 a rich old ruler. And Jesus doesn't say anything to him about selling his possessions. He just says, you need to be born again. You need to be made new on the inside. So what is it about Jesus? Is Jesus trying to punish this guy? Is he trying to give him something so hard that it's just impossible for him? Actually, none of those things is true. In fact, what the Bible says about Jesus' response when he's asked the question, he initially says, look, look, you've got to treat people well. Don't cover what you don't have. Honor your parents and all things like that. And then when the guy pushes back, that's when he says this thing about selling your possessions. But before it, it comes this incredible, powerful verse. He says this, Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, Go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. And then the passage goes on. It says this. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his word. But Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. With this young man, Jesus looks at him and he loves him. He says, I'm not telling you this stuff about money and finance to get on your case. I'm not doing it because this is somehow in my interests. It's not like the kingdom of God needs your money no more than Zoom needs your investment. They're both going to be fine, by the way. But Jesus is saying there's something about you that needs to be set free. And money can be a harsh taskmaster. Money can actually hold you captive. Money can affect us in such powerful ways. But there's something about Jesus and he looks at this guy and his heart is full of compassion. He loves him. He looks at him with one piercing look. The son of God says, I know you, I see you. 
And listen, let's draw it back to you. If you're here and you're not yet uh, sure about God or faith, you're watching wherever you are, you just need to know, if you hear nothing else from me tonight, you need to know that Jesus sees you and Jesus loves you. But there is something that Jesus wants to do. It's kind of like an intervention with this young man. Because here's what he says. He says it's harder for a rich man to enter God's kingdom and to have a share in what God is doing in humanity. It's harder for that to happen than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. This is something, and again, Jesus is using hyperbolic language. He's, he's, he makes big language to make a big point. But essentially he's saying this. And, and let me put it like this. There is an inextricable link between faith and finance. Faith and finance are connected. And if no one has ever told you that before, then it's no wonder that you can sometimes feel offended when Christians talk about faith. Sometimes people will say to us, you know, why at Metro do you always talk about money? And the reality is that we we don't actually talk about it um, as much as Jesus talks about it. If you look at the the scripture, if you look at the Bible, there's 2,300 plus verses in the Bible about wealth, money, and possessions. 15% of Jesus' teachings were actually about money and finance. One in 10 of all gospel verses are actually about money. They're about finance. They're about wealth. In fact, in the book of Luke, it's one in seven. Jesus was always talking about money. And on this occasion, it was so hard to hear. It was so controversial. It was so challenging, so upsetting that people left Jesus. This man, he can't handle it. He goes away sad because faith and finance are inextricably linked. There's a connection between faith and finance. Now, again, if you're not used to church, maybe no one has ever told you this. Maybe you come to Jesus and maybe you approach faith like this man, this rich young ruler approached faith. He comes to Jesus with a faith question. And Jesus gives him a finance answer. Why? Because faith and finance are connected. Finance has incredible power. Our wealth, our money, our possessions, our relationship with money. It has incredible power to influence us and to affect us. In Jesus' mentality, almost more than anything else, it's finance that can make you feel more anxious, more depressed, more worried, more driven. It's finance and the, the, the worry of money that can break apart relationships. More marriages end in the UK because of money, financial problems, than any other factor. And finance can drive us. It can motivate us. It can get us to change our values. It can get us to screw up our relationship with work and with life so that the balance goes through the window. And the Bible's very clear that money's not wrong. It's not evil in and of itself. But there's something about finance that makes you trust it. You think, if I've got enough money, then I'll be okay. If I can have a nest egg, if I've got enough money for a rainy day, then I can rest easy at night. And we end up trusting in money and trusting in our bank balance and trusting in our savings rather than trusting in God. And actually, it can come to a point where we aren't able to move forward in our relationship with God because of the effect of money on our lives. And if you say to me, well, Philip, you're clearly speaking to the wrong person because, yeah, I get it. This guy is rich and he's young and he's a ruler. Um, Now, I am not rich. I am actually struggling. But the reality is that on a global scale, we do really, really well. The average... um, Net worth of an European adult is actually $144,000, more like $145,000. For an Indian adult, it's around about $7,000. And for an African uh, adult, it's about $4,000. So compared with the majority of the world, if you live in the West, if you're watching this on an electronic device, you are most likely richer than 90% of the world's population. And so because of that, we have the challenge of dealing with money. And Jesus says, look, I love you and I want you to be free. 
I don't want you to be crippled with anxiety and money worries. I want you to know that there's a way that you can live which is generous, which is open-handed and which is open-hearted, which is counter-cultural. And that's why when we talk about following Jesus, at one point or another, we will talk about finance and giving because the Bible talks about it as a kind of a spiritual gift. In fact, the Apostle Paul, when he spoke to the churches, to the Romans, he said, listen, giving is a gift. And if you have that gift, if God has given you that gift, then give generously. But it's a gift, just like preaching is a gift, and prophecy is a gift, and serving is a gift. It's a spiritual gift, and it's a spiritual discipline. It's a practice Just like prayer and scripture reading and the practice of Sabbath, these are spiritual principles, practices that we can do in order to have healthy spirituality and have a whole inner life. Because when we come under God's love and into his family, we learn to trust him first, not money. We learn to trust that actually God loves us so much, he can care for us. We don't want to have to live under the thumb of finance, but we can live in the expansive grace of God. And that's what Jesus wants to teach this young man. He wants him to know, listen, you can be free. And maybe God allows him to receive money back, and maybe he doesn't. But either way, God can provide for his needs. And if you've not yet learned the lesson that we can live generously, we can practice the spiritual discipline of giving and generosity, then this is a message which might be hard for you to take. We've literally had people who've left the church because we we talk about money. At the same time, you don't have to agree. If you don't agree, then that's fine. We can still be family. But it's something that's worth looking at. I've told this story before, but it's one of my favorite stories. And I was just reminded of it again just this week, thinking about this message. But I learned from an early age about the power of generosity and actually about the way in which God can change your life by a simple act of giving away what you've got. I was actually uh, 11 years old. Just the backstory was I was brought up and born in Nigeria. Nigerian dad, English mum, they're watching. Hi, mum. <laughs> Hi, dad. Um, and uh, we lived in Nigeria. But when I got to 11, secondary school, parents said, right, you're going to England, living with your auntie in Bel Air. No, uh, living with your grandma and your granddad in York. Kind of similar. And so that's what I did. And in my school holidays, I would come back to Nigeria. This particular school holiday, it was my birthday. It was going to be my birthday when I went home to England. And so my parents said, we'll give you your birthday present when you you come to us and then you can open it back in England. And because I was away and banished from my parents' presence, I decided I'm going to get the best present possible. And I had my eyes set on this technical Lego set. This was a Rolls-Royce Silver Ghost 1906 six-cylinder inline engine developing 60 brake horsepower. A beautiful work of poetry in motion. And I wanted this thing so badly. But it cost, ladies and gentlemen, carry at me this, it cost 10 pounds. Yeah. 10 whole English pounds. In fact, in those days, because I'm I'm a lot older than I look, I'm actually 84. Um, No, this was... This was what? This was the 80s. 10 pounds is probably worth a bit, like 50 or 60 pounds in today's money. It was a lot of money for an 11-year-old kid, but I figured my parents are good for it because they put me in this harsh situation. And so we go in, and uh, I'm in Nigeria, and I say, I want this, and my parents capitulate. They give me 10 pounds. It's three days before I'm due to fly back to England. We go to a midweek Bible study that my dad and mum are doing in their church. They have started a church in Nigeria. They've started this church. It's one church. It's, it's kind of not much to look at. It's like this wooden frame building, more shack than church. Uh, but it's, you know, people are starting to come to faith. And we go in, I've got 10 pounds and I am set. I'm going to get my Rolls Royce silver ghost. But my dad begins to speak about money. And it's always dangerous when my dad speaks about money. And he talks about how you can have God as your master or money as your master, but you can't have both. 
And he talks about generosity, and he talks about trusting God, and he talks about not living by what you've got in your wallet. And uh, he goes on like this, and at the end, basically, what he, the old man, he wants to get money to build a better church. Not a wooden frame building, but a proper church that will last. It's a, a wonderful dream and ambition. But he says, right, so we're going to have a gift day. We're going to pledge. And then he says, who will pledge five pounds? I'm like, Dad, <laughs> you made a rookie error. I've only got 10 pounds. I can't give you five pounds because that'd be 50% of everything I've got. You should have started at one or two. Maybe you'd have got some of my cash. But you went too high. You blew your load. I'm sorry. I'm out. So I stand there, sit there with my, my little arms folded. And then my father says, okay, a few people respond, who will give 10 pounds? And at this point, I start to find myself being affected. And I start to think about who do I really trust with my money? Do I really trust in Jesus? And I find myself putting my hand up and saying, yeah, I'll give 10 pounds. And it was literally everything that I had. And three days later, I'm due to go back home and I have to say goodbye. It was actually a Sunday. And so I'd gone to church with my parents. And at the end of the service, they're going to drive me to the airport. And as I'm leaving, a guy comes up to me and he says, Ah, Philip, it is so good to see you. Uh, How are you doing? Shake my hand when you go. And I want to congratulate you on good, sorry, Nigerian accent. I can do this. You can't. (laughs) Shake his hand. And then he goes away. And then in my hand, there's this folded up note. It's 10 pounds. I can't believe it. I put it in my pocket. I've got my 10 pounds back. I go to another person. He then says, ah, Philips, we are sad to lose you. Shake my hand. Shake five pounds in my hand. So I go around the church. I'm just shaking hands with every person, left, right, and center, everyone that I can see. I came out of that church meeting with 110 pounds in my pocket. Never bought the car. Never felt the need. Just discovered that actually you don't have to trust in money. You can trust in God. And this is not one of those messages that says you give to God and he'll give you 100 pounds back. It is a message that says actually God loves us so much and he wants us to learn to live free and trusting in him as children that are open to him. And so this is what he does. And actually, I feel that not only did I come out with, uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't let down. God did not let me down. But I came out with a share in something greater. And actually, that church is still there today. I visited it just a few years ago. Forty years on, it's still there. In fact, that church has mushroomed and it's grown. And it's now grown into... 750 churches in 45 nations. And that deserves a carry act. You can have a share in what God is doing. And it's the most wonderful thing. We're going to bring the band up in just a second, but I I want to pray. And I want to just lay out um, the way that we do giving in Metro. And I'll just give it to you quickly. We don't have time to go into it fully here. But I'll just say it's this. We use three Ps. It's predetermined, it's personal, and it is proportional. And that's taken from Scripture. And if you do one of the mentoring sessions, we'll go through that with you. But what it just means is your giving should be like Netflix. It's just put in the standing order, goes out every month. It's predetermined ahead of time. It's personal, which means you make the choice. You do whatever you feel is right. And then it's proportional. So those that have more, we can give more. Those that have less, maybe we can give less. But it's in proportion to what you get. If you'd like to find out how to give, then just go to the website. It's woodlandsmetro.church slash giving. And uh, you can actually find out, as perhaps you're new to the church, uh, this is how we do it. This is how we give. But let me give you the big idea. Then we're going to pray, and then we'll get the band up. Here it is. Faith and finance are inextricably linked. The spiritual discipline of giving helps set us free as shareholders in God's kingdom. Let's pray right now. Father God, we want to pray that we would be people who know what it is to live generously. 
I want to pray that we be people that don't put finance above faith, but have faith that informs our financial decisions. And I want to pray particularly for those that are struggling right now. Lord, for those that have lost jobs or are finding themselves in debt or are desperate and don't know where to turn. I want to pray that you would provide their needs. But I want to pray, Lord God, that you would be challenging so many of us to be people of generosity, to give into what you are doing, to be shareholders in your future coming kingdom that we might see our money being used for good in this world, in this day, in this age. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.